been told, oh, die to yourself. Pick up your cross. We don't have a cross. Jesus took our cross. Yes. And I just want to remind us this morning, we don't have a cross. We don't need to die to self. We don't need to worry, oh, more of you, less of me, Lord. It's finished. It's finished. We don't need to worry about, uh, it's, just, it's everywhere. It's everywhere, all around us. And the songs that we sing sometimes, and the lessons we hear, the cross is not before us. The cross is behind us. That's why we're here today. That's why we're celebrating. That's the power of salvation. Jesus died once for all. If we simply walk in it, what does that mean? How do I walk in it? It means moment by moment. We choose to trust in his finished work and that it is truly finished. That he has done it all. That he has made the way where there is no way. We stand and we believe and we choose life. We choose resurrection power. And that is how we give glory to God. That is how we show our thankfulness for what he's done. Is we walk in it. We take it out into this darkness. We take it out into this dying and hurting world. And we share the hope and the peace and the rest. Oh, the rest. It comes from ceasing from our own efforts to be perfect and resting in his perfection. He has made you perfect. He has made you holy. He has made you righteous. Oh, but in this flesh there is no good thing. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. Oh, the power of his resurrection. So live in resurrection power. Walk in resurrection power, and that is how we glorify God. So we're going to reorganize things and shake it up a little bit this morning. Um, The children would like to come sing for you this morning. We have just a brief program, and I have put Gabby in a very precarious position as volunteering the minute she walks in, so grace to all. (laughs) And um, we'll have the kids join us, yeah. Not for man 
stopped and said his name aloud. He said, my name is Lazarus, who that just fought? My name is Lazarus, and it's good to be alive. When I in chains of death was bound, this man named Jesus pulled me out. If you think yeah. your little problem is too big for him, so stick it from the wall and serve the mighty voice of God. Yeah. The living testimony of his death divine touch. My name is Lazarus.
Pilate asks what he should do with Jesus, known as the King of the Jews. Crucify him, shouted the people. Pilate asks why, what has he done? The people continue to shout. Pilate called for a bowl of water and let everyone see him wash his hands of sending an innocent man to death. He ordered that Barabbas be freed instead. Jesus, known as Mary Magdalene, went to the tomb. 
She was astonished to find that the huge stone had been removed and the body had, had gone. She ran to tell Peter and John, who found the burial sheets in the tomb. Mary, weeping, was approached by a man she did not know, who asked her why she was crying. She explained that it was because they had taken her Lord away. The man was Jesus, risen from the dead. Jesus appeared to the disciples several times, and later Jesus spoke to all the, dis the disciples, telling them that once they had gone, once he had left them, they would receive the power of the Holy Spirit. He wanted them to spread the word of God throughout the world. Jesus was then taken into heaven. Two angels appeared and told his friends not to be sad because one day Jesus would return.
I hope I don't take too much time. A couple things. I finally get it. <laughs> well, well, hallelujah. Yeah. I, I get it that a light bulb came on. So, you know, I, I've heard, you know, in the past, kind of going back to what pastor said, you know, what's going to preach on today? I always preach on praise. Well, it's because we need to get it in us so that it becomes second nature to flow out of us. You know, when, when you're practicing in sports, you're, you know, a, a pitcher in baseball doesn't practice multiple things. He practices the same thing over and over and over again. And that's what we need for grace. So for me, I've got a praise report and a prayer request. So I was out and working all this week. I had to speak at the conference. And I was just exhausted coming back. I'd been on an airplane in the airport for about 12 hours on Friday. And got finally got a cab at about 9.30 at night. And I just didn't even want to talk to the guy. You know, but he opened up initially and just started, you know, as soon as I got in the cab, started talking about salvation and the Lord. And it was his first night back driving the cab. The guy had been dead, almost been dead three times. He said in his life, he was 55 now, um, he had family that were religious. And he had prayed the sinner's prayer and accepted the Lord three times, but he said it was all a lie. And... So I'm, I'm praying, well, well, Lord, what should I even say to this guy? Because this guy feels he's lived a rough life. He doesn't feel he's worthy of salvation, which none of us are. And, but God's kept him alive, and he's got a purpose for him. So it was so awesome. So I, first of all, it, it was awesome because he let me pray with him. You know, when I got dropped off at home, I got, I got to pronounce a blessing over his life. But my friend Paul he needs to find a good church. He needs, his, his family's all down in Texas. But he felt he had to come back up here, even though his family was entirely against it because he feels like he needs to be here for some reason. So just praying that he can get the right church, the right Christian friends. He's, he's confused. What he's seen in, in life, his family is very religious, and so they've actually kind of pushed him away from salvation because, they, you know, yeah, you prayed the sinner's prayer, but you went back and you lived in the ways of the world. Therefore, you know, God's not going to accept you. That sort of thing. So my friend Paul, he just he needs to be encouraged. He needs the right people around him. He needs the right church. He needs to believe that, that Jesus still cares and wants from and has a plan. Yeah. Amen. All right. Yes, I <clears throat> I just want to thank uh, the Lord uh, just how He works out circumstances, and we ask you to change pray for BB. Um, they. Uh, She's still got a lot of things she needs to just, you know, discuss with the Lord. But we had to take her up to Quakerdale, Manning, Iowa. And one thing about driving her up there is she's a captive audience. So you can talk and let her know how much we love her and how much the Lord uh, wants you to make some different decisions and how that your decisions affect other people. You know, if you can look down the line at some of the decisions you make, if you look and see how they're effective, you might make a lot of different decisions. But we just believe that that whole circumstances, you know, God orchestrates things. You know, it's like a chess player; they they don't look at one move ahead; they're looking farther down. That's the way God's doing. Yeah. You know, and so we just believe uh, they're Christian based up there. They go to church. They have uh, devotionals. They have that time, and she's far enough away. I mean, it's ninety miles from our house to one way. It's just kind of up her by herself. But we just believe God's going to take that time and work with her and change her life. Because one thing God doesn't do, you know, He doesn't give up on us. You know, other people might, but God doesn't. And that's why the resurrection is so powerful. Everything hinges on Him rising. Because, you know, you have other religious figures, but they're still dead. Yeah. Jesus is still alive. Yeah. And that, that's the whole difference, you know. And He gives you... He gives you beauty for those ashes, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, he, and he turns your life around. And to take that time every day and thank him, there's so many blessings that he gives us every day. And and he don't like to complain it because when we complain, we're saying, God, you're not doing a good enough job. Why don't you do something else? Rather than when you, when you praise God, you know, it just releases so many blessings in your life. Says, God, I may not understand what's going on. But I choose to trust you. Yes. I yes. choose to believe in you. That you know what's best for my life. Someone that knew you before you was in your mom's belly, who knew your name, he can take care of you. Yes. So we just want to thank the Lord. Yes. 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 Yes.
know we're always talking about where is the Lord and the Lord. I, I don't, this last week, I have seen him in a hundred places, mm. in a hundred people. Yes. Wow. Uh, I really feel like there's a great movement. But this morning we saw something on Fox News that absolutely was thrilling. And this guy gave a testimony of he and a friend went out duck hunting in Louisiana. And the weather got real rough. Nobody else was out there. The boat capsized. And they wound up standing on something. Apparently, they were out in the middle of somewhere. But he said, both of us, just our heads were out in the water. And the dog kept swimming around. Of course, they had a dog and a retriever to get the ducks. But nobody was out there. And he said, after the first hour, the, the fellow, there was another fellow there. This guy was older than I am, so the other guy was older than Gerber. But anyhow, he was, he was there, and uh, he told him, he said, I can no longer fill my, my body. I'm so cold. And, and the guy said, there is nothing we could do. Nothing. And this is the good part. After two hours, they just had all been given up. Nobody had come. And he said... I put both hands up. Now here's the here's the thing. The Bible says when we seek him with all our heart, he'll we'll find him. And he said, out of total desperation and death looking me in the face, he said, I raised my hands in the water with just my head and my hand out of water, and I said, God, if you're there and you do really exist, give me a second chance. And he said, within 15 minutes on the horizon, he saw a little white dot. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And he said, it was a trawler, a trawler, you know, fishing boat, big enough that it saw. And he said, here's the thing that blew my mind. When the boat came up to us, he said, on the side of the boat, it said, second chance. <laughs> He said, don't tell me or people like me who have had an encounter with God that he doesn't exist. Amen. And I thought, wow, only on a fox would you see this. Thank God for fox. I speak in new tongues, 
I lay hands on the sick and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. All right, John and Donnie, you two want to come take the offering this morning, please? something that uh, I want to share something uh, we had an awesome time here last Sunday the Holy Spirit was moving mightily in this place and <clears throat> and a lot of times I discern that the enemy tries to come in right afterwards and, and just try to totally trash everything out and I don't think I'm the only one who sensed that or may have faced that but Monday my world it was crushed um, the enemy just come in and just lies and everything else was just just fallen all around me. Uh, as I got home Monday night from work, uh, it started out migraines. Uh, I couldn't even hardly see or see my keyboard at work. Just things through the whole day were manifesting left and right, left and right. Um, I don't know if I was having a stroke or whatever, but it was just the enemy pulling his stuff. I'll yeah. just use that word this morning. Um, <clears throat> I got home and my world was totally crushed. Uh, immediately I had to seek the Holy Spirit and the, what's going on, see beyond my eyes, see beyond what I see with my physicalness, uh, reached out to a few um, whom the Lord specifically said you need to be in <coughs> unity with those in the Spirit uh, to confront the situation. <clears throat> Before, uh, right after the midnight hour, breakthroughs started happening already, right? Through the week, things that, mountains that were placed in front of me were dissolving. And even with my wife, as we face these mountains together, they're dissolving, yes. okay? I asked the Lord, what's going on through this situation? And revealed to me, even this morning, that this is what my son faced. He faced the darkest time in his life. He was crushed. He was crushed. He was crushed. But the Father has a plan, and He had a plan for him also. 
And not only did his plan include himself, but also all of us. Yes. And the Lord had spoken to me about this situation. He says, I want you to take this situation that you have faced, that I have helped you to get beyond. Mm -hmm. And you need to share it with others as far as his power and his yes. resurrection and his glory. The last two days, the scripture had come into place, and we've been speaking of grace, and this is the message of this church, that Jesus did it all. Yes. We can't add to it. We cannot add to it. And best of all, we can't take anything away from it. It's the truth. Acts 4.33, and with great power, the apostles, that's all of us, gave witness to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Yes. I see that in this church. And as we understand and as we comprehend it through the Holy Spirit and through the word that is preached, as we worship him, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the power of this grace will go forth. Yes. And nothing can stop it. Amen. Just, uh, I was thinking this morning, you know, I was just sitting there and uh, I was thinking of the victory Jesus had. And the uh, scripture came to me and said, when Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning out of the sky. And I've been hearing a lot of people going through stuff. And uh, the reason why the devil fell so fast is because God resisted him. That's why he fell like light. And that's the victory he gave us today. Yes. If you resist him, he is going to flee from you like a bolt of yes. lightning. Come on. Because the power that Jesus gave you. He yes. said, I gave you power to trample on serpents. Yes. And that's that. If you resist him, it's like lightning. Yes. That's how fast he has to live. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the victory. <laughs> and with that, we worship him.
many of you know our ship has come in? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Amen, amen. That's an old, almost cliche anymore, but uh, he may not come when you want him or when you think he ought to be there, but he's always right on time. I just think, you know, if the guy had been rescued immediately, it would have been great, but it wouldn't have been God, even though it was God. It, it would have just been a, a lucky break, a coincidence. Sometimes it takes those dark times, those shadowy times, before you really see the light of God, you know. And I, I'm not saying God creates those situations. I'm just saying he takes advantage of them. Everything, he says, in this life is designed for our good, for our well-being, for our success, for our victory. Amen. And today is a perfect example of that. It's the greatest day of humanity and for humanity, whether they know it or not. Certainly for Christians, it's the greatest day of the calendar year. But the truth is, every day for us is Resurrection Day. Every day for us is eternal life. Because it's in Him. And because He lives, we have a guarantee that we will live also. Amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thanks again to the worship team. They do a great job. Let's, let's just thank them this morning. Praise God. Hallelujah. And the young people. They did great. Amen. And uh, they just kind of plug them in and thank God goodness for those that came and were brave enough to stand up here and do what they did. Hallelujah. Praise God. And those of you that heard uh, Tammy prayer request, and she just got a notice from Dan from the hospital that skin graft took 100%. Woo! And, uh, you know, you'd have to know the situation, but this is something he's dealt with for 10, 15, maybe 20 years. I don't know, a long, long time. So uh, an open wound that just would not heal. And, uh, but praise the Lord, the skin graft is taken. And hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, we've had a, a, a full morning already, and I'm going to try to be brief and uh, just to the point, because we're going to take uh, communion after this message, and I want us to—I want you to be able to get out of here at a reasonable time. It is Easter Sunday, and I know families want to spend time together, and that's really what it's about, the whole day of celebrating the risen Savior and how that uh, affects all of our lives and every part of our life. So this morning, I'd like to talk to you about uh, how strange grace is. And uh, to, to begin with, let's go to Luke chapter 24. And we'll begin at verse 31 and just go right on through to uh, verse 45. But uh, we're talking about Resurrection Sunday, you know, Easter Sunday. And it's all about grace. It's about our Savior. And the scripture says that uh, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So uh, it's in our relationship with Jesus that we actually experience grace. You don't experience grace through the law or through religion or by doing good things. You know, there's nothing wrong with doing good things, and we would like everybody to do good things. But doing good things doesn't change anything about your relationship with God any more than doing bad things. Praise the Lord. 
there are consequences to bad behavior. You go to jail, you know, you get divorced, you get all kinds of stuff can happen. But that's not God. Those are just consequences to an action. God loves you. God's grace is there for you in every situation and in every circumstance. And it's more important to God that you understand that than you understand all the theology of religion itself. There's a place for all of that, but without understanding the love of God and the grace that he extends to us, then all of the religion in the world is just a, a confusing mess. And sadly, that's what most of the world knows about God, is religion. That's what's promoted all the time. Instead of promoting God, we're promoting our particular denomination or our particular isms or, or what have you. And uh, the Bible says that we are to just, whatever we do, we're to do it in the name of Jesus. In other words, whatever we're doing, we ought to, we ought to be presenting Christ. And that's not religious. I mean, you know, there's a big difference between being, uh, revealing Christ and being religious. You can reveal Christ in a bar room. <laughs> I know that Make some of you feel better. Some of you maybe not so much. But the grace of God can be revealed. God is everywhere. And he's certainly wherever we are. But try to convince a religious person of that, and you've got a fight on your hands. Praise the Lord. I hear people, I mean, I, Tony uh, Campola had a, art, wrote a, a little essay and, and in this he was talking about a situation that happened where he had uh, got up early in the morning and been on the road. He's a, a Christian writer. He's really not a preacher but he's a Christian writer and he writes a lot on Christian things. And he'd been on the road promoting a book or something and he was in this strange city and he woke up because of, uh, because of the time gaps between where he lived and where he was, the difference in time, he woke up at like 3 o'clock in the morning, starving, on breakfast. So he gets up and he goes, and the only place open is this bar, just around the corner or down the street from his hotel. So he goes to this bar and he goes in and he says, hey, can I get a cup of coffee and a donut or a bagel or a, some toast or whatever? The guy said, sure. So he gets it for him while like he's sitting there having his coffee and Toast. And that's what he said he had. I don't know if he had anything else or not, but praise the Lord. In walks this whole group of prostitutes, and they're just screaming and carrying on and acting like crazy people. And and uh, he said, "What's going on?" And this the one gal said, uh, "Tomorrow's my birthday." And uh, they all laughing at her and poking fun. She said, "No, I've never had a birthday party. I've never had a cake. I've never celebrated my birthday. It's just come and gone." And and these people, the other are all kind of joking with her and teasing her. And then the thing kind of dies down and, and they leave. And so this Tony uh, Campola says to the bartender, he said, hey, how about we have a birthday party for her tomorrow? I'll get a cake and if you'll help put up the decorations, I'll help to cover the cost of the decorations and we'll get everybody involved. So everybody says, sure, yeah, we'll do it. So the next night, same kind of scenario. And, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, in come these prostitutes, and they're all carrying on, shouting, and there's a big banner saying, Happy Birthday, Gladys, or whatever her name was, and a big cake with candles on it. And she comes in, and she just stares, she's totally stunned. And uh, she looks at the banner, and then she looks at the cake, and the bartender hands her a knife, and he said, Here, let's cut the cake so we can all share it. And uh, she looked at it, and she said, uh, would it be all right if we don't cut it? She said, I've never had a cake before. I've never had a birthday party before. She picked up the cake and left. And that's God. That's the grace of God. We look at the woman and say, so what? She hasn't had a birthday you know, party. She's, she doesn't deserve a birthday party anyway. After all, she's a prostitute. She's a lowlife. She's a this or a that. And we can apply that to anybody and everybody. But that's the love of God. Yes. He looks at the prostitutes and says, oh, let's have a party. Yeah. I want to throw you a birthday party. 
That's God. That's the way God looks at us. Whatever your situation is, whatever your circumstance is, say, well, I'm not a prostitute, or I'm not a drunk, or I'm not... No, but we all got crap. We all got issues. And God's saying the same thing to each one of us. I want to have a party for you. I paid for it. I want you to enjoy it. And that's the relationship that God wants us to have. Not with religion, but with Him. A God that loves us in spite of us. And wants us to know that it isn't about us, it's about Him. He accepts us. Yeah, He accepts us. It isn't just because we say, come as you are, He accepts you. He accepts you after you came as you were, and you still are. And He still accepts you. Religion says, if you come as you are, and you stay as you are, that's called backsliding. That's not what God says. God sees the prodigal son and he runs to him. Yes. He throws a party for him. Yes. That's what God wants to do in all of our lives. Continuously, every day. Yes. Each hour of every day. To make you feel accepted, loved, and protected. Yes. And when you finally get to that place, you'll expect God to do miracles. Yes. Why? Not because you deserve it, but that's the kind of God he is. Yes. You'll expect to be healed when you're sick. You'll expect financial breakthroughs when you're going through financial troubles. You'll expect your relationships to get restored when they're all screwed up. Because God wants to do it, and he can do anything. Amen. And he doesn't do it based on how good you are. He does it based on how good he is. Yes. And he loves you just the way you are. Lord. Amen. Praise God. Okay, Luke 24, verse 31. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour, and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. And handle me, and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy... And wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. <coughs> then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And all of that has uh, import this morning, but I want to draw your attention, especially to verse 37, where he says, but they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And then in Luke chapter 5, just one verse here, Luke chapter 5, verse 26. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Praise the Lord. So I, I, uh, I have to laugh at, uh, at people that want God to be predictable. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, if we do this, then he'll do that. Yeah. And uh, they think it's, you know, really not quite fair of God to uh, act suddenly mm-hmm. or to... Uh, be too powerful, too dramatic, amen, too graceful, praise God. They want God prepackaged. That's what religion does. It, it, it confines him in a box. It prepackages him. And uh, they do that because they want to look him over. <laughs> praise
Praise the Lord. They want to check him out. They want to see his acts and then decide whether they want to accept him or not. You know, that can't be God because he ought to be punishing that person. It's like the woman caught in the act of adultery. I mean, the religious people all said, hey, we know what God's supposed to do here. Stoner. And when he stepped outside that religious box, it freaked them all out. They didn't know how to deal with it. But he was really, Jesus was revealing the true heart and the true nature of God. And they were looking at the, the cause and effect of sin. Sin has to be dealt with. The good news is this morning, Jesus has dealt with it. Yes. Praise That's it. God. We're not dealing with it. We're not capable of dealing with it. Man has never been capable of dealing with it. That's what the law was for, was to prove to them that they couldn't deal with it. That they would fail over and over and over. And Jesus came and fulfilled the law and then became sin so that we could be the righteousness of God in Christ. It's that simple. It's the great exchange. It's too good to be true, but it's still true. Religion has a problem with that because it still wants you involved in the equation. But you were never involved in the equation. You were just the sum. You were the, the result of the equation. You get the benefit of the equation without ever being a part of it. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, Easter is God's answer to the human symptom of fear. And it's grace. Yes. I, I, I challenge you to look at religious ways of doing things and tell me it isn't frightening. You know, that you do this and then he'll do that. Because we know, deep down inside, we never quite do that. Right. Not like we should. Right. And so we always are fearful of reprisal. Yeah. Of payback, of punishment, of, you know, that we have coming. We know we deserve it, so we're just waiting for the next shoe to fall. Yeah. That's not God. Right. He has finished it. That's what's so beautiful about Easter. It's a constant uh, and all day reminder of what every day is supposed to be to us. Hope. Yes. Joy. Yes. Something supernatural, something miraculous has happened. And we can expect it to happen every day of our life if we believe it. Yes. These guys had a problem believing it because it was too good to be true. Praise the Lord. See, in, in resurrection... God is making an explosive declaration that we're not only ignorant of His, un, of His unlimited power, but we're also ignorant of the limitless creativity of His methods. We don't expect a boat to come along that says second chance. I mean, it's, what are the odds? We don't expect a God that's going to look at my failure and my weakness and my, my even willingness to be weak at times. Yeah. Even my desire to be weak at times. Yeah. I'd rather, for a moment, you know how many times have you said, you know, I just, you know, Holy Ghost, step back for a moment while I punch him in the face. <laughs> and then, you know, come back immediately. <laughs> or while I bless that driver that just cut me off in traffic. Uh -huh. And we tell him that there's only one God. <laughs> But we don't necessarily use that finger to, to indicate. Hallelujah. I know this is shocking that a preacher would actually even say this, but it's all true, and if any of you ever see me in traffic, you know it. And that's why I don't have the preacher bumper sticker. I don't have to explain later when they follow me to the parking lot and say, well, what was that all about? Momentary breakdown. But God's still with me. Who would have expected the resurrection? Well, the answer in Scripture is clearly nobody. Even those that Jesus told specifically and clearly in advance were caught off guard when it happened. Now, how many times has God told you, I'm going to bless you this way? Or I'm going to do something in your life. I'm going to heal this situation. I'm going to... I'm going to give you a financial breakthrough. I mean, you just sense it. You know, I'm not talking about audible voices here, but it could be. And, but it doesn't happen like you think. 
He said he was going to do it. But when he did it, they all standing there with their mouth hanging open saying, God, this is freaking me out. What happened? Just exactly what he said was going to happen, happened. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Look, look, how could he, I mean, scripture, we'll look at a scripture here in Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 33. Now I want you to read this, and there's no way he could have said it any plainer than this. I mean, he just told them what he was going to do. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. Now this is Jesus. He couldn't have, he couldn't have said it any clearer or any plainer to these believers, to these disciples. Amen? He told them, but they didn't listen. We're all that way to some degree. We'll only hear the expected. We'll only see what we think God can do. We're actually saying we're only going to see or believe what we think we could do if we were really powerful. Or if we had control. We're not, this is not about us. This is about him. This is about the creator of all things. There is no limit to what he can do. Or how he can do it. We say, well, God, God is impressing me that he wants to give me a financial breakthrough. So I buy two extra lottery tickets this week. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Nothing wrong with buying lottery tickets, but that's pretty much limiting to God to three opportunities. You got three shots, Lord. Bring it on. He doesn't need the lottery. I need the lottery. I think that's how he's got to do it, because that makes sense to me. He can't just make it happen some other bizarre, strange, unusual. Yes, he can. He can do anything. Praise God. You know, we, we wish for, we might even pray for, and dream of the unexpected. But if God tells us it's going to happen, we either doubt it or we're afraid of it. Afraid that he won't do it. Afraid that it won't happen. Afraid that for all kinds of reasons we'll come up with, uh, you know, well, we don't want to embarrass God. We don't, want to, we don't want to share this with anybody in case it doesn't happen. I mean, listen to, we're, we're, we're feeding a negative into something that is only positive. And because of that, we wonder then why things don't happen. Amen? Because you don't believe. He said, when you pray, believe that you receive what you pray for when you pray. And you'll have it. Right. Not after you get it. Right. We think that's faith. Hallelujah. What great faith. I got it. But I haven't believed for any of it. And it has inspired me that I got blessed. We think that he might do it. He might not do it. Or we're afraid that he will. And he says he will. So listen, listen to this in Isaiah 28, verse 21. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim, he shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Now, if you think God is predictable, you have not read the Bible. He's strange by any human definition. The things that he does is strange. The thoughts that he has are strange. The plans that he makes, they're strange to us. Humanly speaking. If they're not, then he's not God. He's just a bigger us. 
The promise here is powerful. And it's, it's a commentary on God's unpredictability. The word strange here doesn't mean bizarre. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean weird. The Hebrew word used here means unusual or coming from an unexpected source. Not the lottery, someplace else. Yeah. Someplace you didn't expect it to come from. Mm -hmm. And the examples that the prophet Isaiah gives illustrate my point. Because Mount Perizim refers to a time when God gave David a dramatic victory by breaking forth like a flood over the enemy army that he faced without David's army ever raising a sword. God just broke out like a flood and swept the enemy right off the field of battle. Now believe me, that isn't what they were expecting. The Valley of Gibeon, that refers to the day when the sun stood still in the heavens so that Joshua and his army could complete a total victory over the enemies of God's people. Amen. Not just a partial victory that would mean they'd have to fight again and again and again, but it totally wiped them off. Hallelujah. They were winning the battle. And they were afraid the sun was going to go down before they could finish the battle. And so God held the sun still wow. until they totally annihilated their enemy. Now both of those examples, they speak of victory over adversity. And both were strange. Both were unusual, unpredictable. And both were acts of grace. Because, first of all, Joshua and the people of Israel had murmured and complained and doubted and questioned God and disobeyed God and everything else, but yet God still gave them this tremendous victory. You know the story of David. Adulterer, murderer, name it. God did not defeat his enemy because David deserved his enemies to be defeated. God defeated his enemies because David was God's child. A man after my own heart. Not because he was good. Not because he was deserving. He was simply a believer. So as unpredictable as winning a battle that you don't actually fight in which the enemy is swept in front of you like a tidal wave comes through and just wipes them off the map. That's God's power rolling out ahead of you. As unpredictable as the sun standing still. Now that's strange. Mm -hmm. Strange. Praise the Lord. But not as strange as dead people rising. Come on yeah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. That is the strangest of them all. <clears throat> Empty graves are in a league all of their own. Jesus' resurrection categorically excludes any hopelessness in any situation. Listen to what I'm saying, because I don't know what you're facing or will face. But I'm telling you, today, the resurrection of Jesus categorically excludes any hopelessness in any situation and includes anyone who opens their life to this gift of grace. Amen. 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 That goes for people that are in the hospital today. People that have been diagnosed with terminal illnesses. People that we have prayed for and have not yet seen the victory. But I'm telling you, this day, that's what this represents. It's not just a day that we, you know, pick up eggs and eat chocolate bunnies. And by the way, praise the Lord. I got my first solid chocolate bunny. Amen. Praise the Lord. Not hollow, solid. Substance I'm talking about. Praise God. Hallelujah. How many of you have been eating those hollow ones all your life? shallow. Praise the Lord. Praise God. We got a God that's solid. I got a bunny back there on my desk. Solid. I may have a breakout of acne. I hope I do. 
At 66, I can use anything that reminds me of my youth. Thank the Lord. But I digress. Praise the Lord. God is on the throne. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, what we're talking about here, this is, this is more than uh, life beyond death. It's life beyond hope. Abraham hoped when there was nothing to hope in. This is what resurrection is about, church. This, this ought to inspire us for every day for the rest of our life. Not that, not that we're just going to live forever. We are going to live forever. We've already started that. But that every day we can expect the unexpected. Every day we can expect a strange, unusual miracle from a source that we don't expect. Simply because that's the God that we serve. Not because we've been really good this week. But because He's always good. And He always does strange things. These things are not in the Bible so we can look back and say, what a, what a historic event. No, they're there, Paul says, so that we can come to an understanding of our God. They are types and shadows. They are there to increase our faith. Look, we've got to believe. We've got to expect it if we're going to experience it. You can't just go through your life saying, oh, thank God for grace, and still live as though you're some religious dolt. Resurrection is God's declaration that He will rise up and work unusual deliverance. And it's ultimately confirmed and manifested in this resurrection of Christ. Because it's so strange. Because it was so unpredictable. Even though He had declared it, they, the people that were closest to Him still couldn't believe it. Because it was just too bizarre. Well, just too strange. That God would choose this unusual means by which He would save us. I mean, think about it. It's so off the chart when it comes to rational thinking or, or, or natural ways of trying to figure I mean, we've come up with a million ways and it wouldn't have been this one. When hope fades, life expectancy can rise again. I was thinking about Joni this morning. We don't even know for sure where, he, where she is right now. Because uh, they moved her out of her room and there was nobody at the nurse's station so we couldn't figure out where she is. So I don't know if she's back in rehab, if she, they moved her to a different room or what the deal is. But I mean, in my, in the, naturally, you know, you think, God, well, we've prayed and we've prayed and it's just been you know, one thing and another thing. Almost all of us have been dealt with things like this. I mean, you know, we know that God wants us to be blessed financially. He became poor that we might become rich and we're still struggling trying to get that financial breakthrough and figure out why and pretty soon we start losing hope and we just kind of drop back into that doldrums of just, well, whatever, you know, just hanging in here. Same way with healing. Anybody that's gone through any length of time with a sickness or been close to somebody who has, it, 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 it wears on you in the natural. But that's why this message is so powerful. Because it brings hope when there shouldn't be any hope. It brings an expectation of good when we know we don't deserve anything good. That when shadows crowd in, you can expect the unexpected. Easter is the evidence that such expectations are reasonable. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3.
If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. It's not talking about seeking uh, perfect behavior. It's talking about seeking the things that can only come from God. So if you're risen with Christ, and that's what we are if we're believers, we are crucified with Him, we've been raised with Him, then if that's what we are, then we ought to be expecting the unexpected. We shouldn't be expecting this world to, to, to be able to, to meet the needs that we have. And obviously, it, it won't. Yeah. And that's most of our experiences here. It doesn't quite make it. But if we seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God, declaring your innocence, by the way, right. set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Because you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Amen. Now, for those of you who don't aren't familiar with that scripture, that's how God sees you. That's why this all works the way it works. God sees you, the thing that we see in the mirror every day, He sees that dead. And He sees that our life is now hid with Christ in God. Amen. When you look in the mirror, you do that, ah! that Kramer thing. Seinfeld. Why? Because like they did with Jesus. He's dead. Can't be him. He's dead. But we're alive in Christ. And that's what God sees. Christ. That's why He just pours out His blessings. If you can see yourself the way He sees you, and that's what the whole, whole New Testament is basically trying to convince you of this reality. Why? So that you can get all of the inheritance that God has for you. So you can be healed. So that you can be delivered. So that you can prosper. So that your relationships are made whole. So that all those things work out in your life that He has promised in His Word. That's the desire of God. That's the will of God. I don't, want, I don't need to know what the will of God is about any given situation. Somebody's dying. Well, it's the will of God. That's a lie. It is not the will of God. It was never the will of God. It will never be the will of God. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Stuff happens all the time and it's not the will of God. It's not the will of God that any should perish. But we know people perish. That's not the will of God though. There's choices that they're making. Amen? So you're dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. Someone said that uh, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Amen. And that is the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's why Paul said, uh, I, 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 I rejoice in my weakness or my nothingness. Because me and Jesus is everything. Yeah. Even though I don't add anything to the equation. Right. Philippians 1 uh, verse 21, Sheila. This is the last scripture. So for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. Yeah. It's a win-win. For, me, for to me to live is Christ. Yeah. Not that I'm aspiring to be perfect like Jesus. I'd like to be, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm a realist. Yeah. But for me to live is Christ. As a believer, that's my life is hid in Christ. Do you, do you understand what he's saying? He's not telling you, Paul isn't saying, for me to live is, I'm going to be perfect like Jesus. No, he's saying, if I'm alive, I'm, I'm, I'm Christ in this world. That's what God has declared. If I die, it's gain. I lose the only thing that can condemn me here. My own flesh. That says you're not that. You're not all that. You, you can't do that. You failed this. You failed that. You, you're not a, that good a person. And, yeah. Amen? That's what the devil has to use is your flesh. Praise God. So because of Jesus, the Easter story liberates us to be okay with not being okay. There ought to be more smiles out there right now. 
That's the Easter message, is that you can be okay with not being okay. That's good news. That is the gospel. You can relax that you're not perfect. You can relax that you're far from perfect. Because of his perfection, you've been declared perfect. So you can be okay with being not okay. This is the liberty that he came to give us. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Free of the law, free of guilt, free of condemnation, free of your own anxiety, your own judgment. Praise the Lord. He says we judge all things. Believers judge all things. But we're judged of none. Come on. <laughs> That'll make you a hypocrite in a hurry. <laughs> now, that wasn't God. This is. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about. But nevertheless, in other words, we have discernment. But we can't be judged by anybody because we've already been declared righteous. There's no double indemnity. You can't be charged with the same crime. You've already been punished for it in Christ. And I'm telling you, this will cause people to live better, more moral, more Christian lives than all of the judgment, all of the condemnation, all of the fear, all of the you know reprisals, all of the being shunned by the church or your friends or whatever. You'll do more by accident. That is Christian in, in its true sense of the word than you ever will by somebody standing in front of you constantly barking out the next rule, the next law, your last failure, the next failure you're expected to make. And just say, man, all I see is Jesus. That's what Paul said. When I look at the congregation, he was looking at people that were adulterers, that were drunks, that were involved in incest. I'm not endorsing any of this behavior. I'm just saying that's what Paul looked at and he said, I refuse to see anything but Christ and Him crucified. Because that's what God sees. This will make you happy if you can just believe it. If you can just receive it and accept it. You don't have to take my word. Read the Bible. That's what he's talking about. That's the whole message. I mean, it's called the good news. I don't know about you, but I was in a church for a long time, and it, I really wasn't hearing all that much good news. Most of it was pretty depressing. There was a chance that I might be saved, but most every day I pretty much blew it. And there weren't enough hours in the day for me to repent of everything I was doing wrong. If I didn't, I wouldn't have ever had time to do anything else. Because, come on, the law says it isn't just what you do, it's what you even think about doing. So a lot of stuff I didn't do. Well, not a lot, but there was some stuff that I didn't do. But I thought about it. I, if I could, if I, I mean, just being honest, if I thought I could, if I could get away with it. So it wasn't because I was such a great Christian, it was I was a coward. I've been in jail. I don't ever want to go back. So, praise the Lord. It wasn't that I was so righteous and holy. I just wasn't completely stupid. So I didn't do a lot of things simply because I knew if I did it, I'd probably get caught. The odds are going to be that I'll get busted. Jesus. Praise the Lord. But God forgive me even the thought. Yep. Yeah. Even my intent. Think of the prodigal son. We said, oh, he repented and came home. He didn't repent. He got hungry. He got hungry and there was food at his dad's place and there wasn't where, where he was at. Yeah. Right. He rehearsed the speech and, and the old man didn't even let him give it. Right. In my father's house, you know. Food enough to spare. And, and, and the father who represents God wouldn't even let him say it. Right. He just embraced him. Right. Give him the ring. Sandals. The robe. Kill the fatted calf. Let's yeah. have a party. That's what God wants with all of us all the time. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's okay to not be okay. And we know we're not okay. 
even though we try to convince other people that we are. But Easter tells us, relax. It's finished. Because of what and who we celebrate this morning, we have nothing to prove and nothing to protect. Christ's finished work grants to us the strength to admit we're weak, we're needy, and we're restless. But knowing that Christ's finished work has proven to be all the strength and the fulfillment and the peace that I could ever want, and then some. That's called life, and that more abundantly. Praise God. Because He lives, we live in Him. Strange, isn't it? Flood destroying, sun stopping, dead raising. Strange. But that's resurrection life. And that's the life we celebrate this morning and every morning as believers. You give the Lord a hand clap this morning. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. If I could get a couple of you fellas to come up and, and pass out the elements here of the communion, we'll, we'll have communion and then dismiss. And Sheila, if you would bring up uh, Ephesians 1, verse 7. Guys are passing the uh, <clears throat> bread and wine. In Ephesians 1, verse 7, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Did you hear that? We have redemption, we've been redeemed. Be redeemed means to be put back in the original place where Adam and Eve were before they fell. Perfect relationship with God. They were innocent. They weren't really good people. They were just innocent. It's like a little child. They act up, they're naughty and everything else. We don't treat them the same way we do if they were 18. If it's a two-year-old, we just say, oh, they're innocent. They don't know what they're doing. Cut them some slack. That's what God does. We've been redeemed to a position of innocence. Praise God. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And his grace abounds, superabounds, Meaning, where sin is, it says, grace abounds. So whatever the sin is, grace is always greater. No matter what the sin. <coughs> Amen? So, because Jesus paid the penalty for your sin. Blood is for forgiveness. He paid for your sins with His spotless blood. So when you take the cup this morning, when you drink this grape juice, which symbolizes His blood, you need to know that you are forgiven. Whatever you brought in here this morning, whatever guilt, whatever shame, whatever, you know, whatever, it's it's been dealt with. And when we take this, we're saying, I believe it. I'm receiving. He says, as often as you do, this is my blood. It's to remind you that you are perfectly forgiven. The blood of Jesus has given you right standing before God. You didn't do it. You can't do it. He did it. It ought to make you not arrogant and not boastful and proud, but it ought to make you confident. At ease, at peace. It's all good. 
Praise the Lord. And the bread? In this case, oyster crackers. Praise the Lord, whatever it is. Uh, but it's, symbol, it's symbolic, right? It's, it's a symbol. And it's the symbol of His body being broken for us. So bread is for healing. Blood for forgiveness. Bread for healing. Let's look at Mark, uh, Sheila. Mark uh, 7, 26 through 28. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. Now he was talking about people that were under the covenant at that time, which were the Jews. She was a Syrophoenician, so she was a Gentile and wasn't a part of the covenant. So she didn't really have a right to the promises of the covenant. And it says that uh, Jesus said to her, Let the children first be filled, for it's not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it under the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, but the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Praise the Lord. So the bread, even a small crumb, which is his body, is for healing. Because of what Jesus did at the cross, we don't just have forgiveness. We also have healing. And the same faith that you have for forgiveness is the same faith that brings you healing. All right? That's what we're doing here. So this isn't just so we can fill up some of the final few minutes of a service, because we don't do this all the time, although you can. But you should expect to be free. You should expect to feel good. You should expect to, to just like a bird is lifted, you're just light white. Because you don't have to be condemned. You don't have to be guilty. You don't have to be ashamed. It's all good. He, he's happy. He's contented with you. He loves you. Who cares what other people think? Let him get over it or get, out, get past it, you know? He's happy. Be happy. My favorite. Don't worry. Be happy. Praise the Lord. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. If you've got symptoms in your body, something nagging, you know, physical, uh, emotional, something that's stressing you and you, you, you just don't know what to do, you've been to the doctor, you, you don't want to go to the doctor, whatever. It's healing. The body is for your healing. Expect to be healed. Praise the Lord. And if you can, get 25 up there at the same time. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, so speaking of the bread, and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. So you need to leave here this morning knowing, not hoping, not wishing, not desiring, but knowing you're forgiven, Amen. you're accepted, right. and you are healed. Yes. Because he said so. I know it's strange, but that's God. Yeah. Amen? The Lord bless you. Yes. Have a great resurrection Sunday and a great resurrection life. The Lord bless you. Thank you all for being here. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Praise God.
Praise the Lord, my brother. Yeah, I am.